the seed of the adulterer mm-hmm. and the call. Against whom do you support yourself? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression, the seed of falsehood? And flaming yourself with idols under every green tree, slay the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They, they are thy gods, even to them as thou afford a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in this? Upon a lofty and high mountain of God said thy dead, even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Behind the doors also are the pools of God set up thy remembrance, for thou hast discovered thyself to another than me, and I gone up, thou hast been back at thee, and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest that dead, where thou sawest it. And thou blessest the king, the only thing that did increase thy perfumes, and this send thy messengers far, and this to be based thyself even unto them. Thou art weary in the greatness of thy way, yet sayest not thou not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the power of life in thy hand, that all oh, thou was not great. And those are the basic verses to our passage today. And all this point to one thing the people of God had left him and gone to worship idols. And now God is confronting them with their sins. And he says, he said, he told them that, that they, they were, they, they, they looked for success, they didn't find it, and they didn't even think that this way they were called, the way of adulation, the way of social and witchcraft, that there was no hope there. You know, they were not great with their sinfulness and iniquity. And this is the picture of the church today. There are many people of God who come to church day in, day out, but actually are eating at the table of Satan. Meaning that they have a problem, they will not come to God. They will go to their babalawas and witch doctors and the money for fraternity and the shrines in the villages. So even though they are coming to church and wearing the sutana, they are also worshipping idols. idols. This is the picture of the church. So this message is very relevant to the church today. So that they are, you are not wearing in the greatest of the way. You didn't say that you know, we keep on going down this path of falsehood. And God says, why you have been afraid, or who has that been afraid of? And that was, what is making you run to those gods? Remember that the story in the book of Second Kings, where this king had fallen from the lattice, I think it was Queen Uzziah. And instead of going to ask the prophet of God, you know what he did? He sent a message to, uh, to one of the consults. Let's actually read it. Second Kings chapter one, verse after verse one. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ahaziah fell down to a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said to them, Go to Baal Beelzebub, the god of Acorn, whether I shall recover from this disease. This is the king in the land of Judah, the king of Israel. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that I am go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? This is what the angel of God asked the prophet Elijah to go and Elijah to go and confront that king. Now therefore, God says the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, for thou shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. So Elijah went on an errand which the angel had told him to do. Go. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you not turned back? So the messengers, God told Elijah to go and tell the messengers of that king, Ahaziah, that is there not a God in Israel that is going to live in the God of Israel and go to worship the Zimbabwe the God of Ekron? Because of that, God told him he would not become that serious and he would die. Now, so the messengers returned to the king and he said, Why are you not turned back? Because they came back so quickly and he knew that they wouldn't have even gone to where they were going. But they said unto him, There came a man to meet us and said unto us, Go, turn again to the king that sent you. And say unto him, Thus says the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of the 
Siva, you got a good point. That was actually not come down from that day, and they were gone up. They said, surely that. And he said unto them, What manner of man was it which came up to meet you? And I told you this words. And they answered him, He was a very man, the guy, the guy that led about his friends. And he said, It is a Niger the Tishman. See? And then the king sent them to go and arrest Elijah. And you know the story? How Elijah called on fire of God and killed two sets of 50 men, making a hundred with their leaders, other than two men, were killed as the fire came down. So God demonstrated his power, and this is very important to say, is there not a God in this church? Is there not a God in uh, any other church that you have to live the God Jehovah? And go and seek help from an idol. I said, Who are they? Now, what is making you afraid? That like you have lied. In other words, they are lying because they are coming to church at the same time they are going to worship the idols. God says, What is it so, so scary that is making you afraid that you keep on lying and you have not remembered me or led you to your past? What's it have not? I heard that peace, even of all that was. All these things you are doing are seeds. You can deceive the pastor, you can deceive those of the church, but you cannot deceive God because God is omnipotent, omniscient, He knows everything. Even if you go to the bottom of the sea, He knows you're there. That's what King David said. Every thought you think, God records it. Everywhere you go, God knows it. So you can deceive men, but you can deceive God. God said, did I not know all this is you are doing? And I just have my peace. You think I didn't know what you were doing? This is the question God is asking you about today. Psalm 50, verse 21. Psalm 50, verse 21. So this is a message relevant to you. If you are one of those who involved in going to worship an idol or a paying sacrifice, to a, a killing powers, to worship the shrine of God, you better assist from it because God knows what you're doing behind it. You know, Psalm 50, verse 21. Okay. Yes. These things you have done. Yes. And I kept silent. Mm -hmm. You thought I was all together like you. Yes. But I will rebuke you. That's it. And set them in order to you. That's it. So because God has not killed you, you think God doesn't know. Or you think God is happy with what you're doing. No, 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 no. Not at all. He's just giving you a chance to turn away from your wickedness where you want to have. Many of you keep on going down that path until you die and you find yourself in hell fire. So it's a warning for you today to resist the decision of such evil works. He said, I have not I have my peace even for and that carries me not. That was says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you fear God, you will not sin against him. You will try your best not to sin against him. But if you don't fear God, then you go on with sinning. Think that God doesn't care. And God says, I will detract my righteousness and my works, but this is not perfect. The Bible says, because I'm going to tell you exactly what you've been doing. You think I didn't know? I'm going to tell you. Say, so when you cry, let your company deliver you, but you don't cry in the way. What's he referring to? Referring to my idols. That was when you point to problem, don't come to me. No, no, no. Go to that shrine with your fathers and mothers and grandfathers in the village. That's where you should go. But let me know then that that wind. The wind of God shall carry them away and God shall take them. But he that put his trust in me shall possess the land and shall get the holy mountain. In other words, rather than you go to that, that idol, if you put your trust in me, you will survive. The wind will not take you away. You will inherit heaven and be with me. But if you don't trust me and your trust is in idols, then you carry them away. You know that's what happens to those who go to hell by When they call your name and you stand before Jehovah God and they check your works, they find that your name is not in the book of life and your works are evil, you just hear the sound. Depart! And you know what happens? Immediately a wind from nowhere will just come and carry that person to hell by So what is that is the desire for happiness on the judgment day. That is, those that put their trust in me shall possess the land and inherit my holy man. That was, you are going to 
be where God, Jehovah, is, where he lives. But if you don't put your trust in him, you put your trust in the idols, you will not be there. Psalm 37, verses 3 and 9, Matthew 5 and 5. Psalm 37, verses 3 and 9. God is saying that you better put your trust in me because the day will come and you have to pay for your religion. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. So shall I be in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. The rest of the Lord are good vision for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way. Those people doing money ritual and avoiding and all these things and they are prospering. Don't fret because of them. Don't envy them. Don't want to be like them. See, many of you, you do a convention, say, oh, I want to be like that man. You don't know how to get his money, whether he uses his husband or his wife. You don't know. But you want to be like him. That's what happens to you to over and join spiritualists. You want quick money. You don't know how to get the money. So, wait patiently for him. You see? Wait for God. The blessings of God, he make it rich without adding sorrow to it. No, but you don't you can't wait for God. You want your money like yesterday. Well, you will get it, but at the end it will be very bitter. Friend of the Lord, because of him prospers in his way. Those prosperous, from one night, they are real boys. They are prospering, but you don't know their end. Because of the man who brings their wicked devices to pass. Frauding people on the internet, deceiving people, taking people's money. <laughs> He's buying houses, cars. But those cars and houses will be the end of it. You see? For evil blood shall be cut off. For those that are from the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, that shall be the to consider his place, and he shall not. But the nature of the area has a desire to show us that one does this. That's this. Matthew 5 verse 5. Amen? Matthew 5 verse 5. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. That's it. Jesus said that. Who are the meek? It is the people who are gentle and humble. They are waiting for God's time. They don't use that power, they don't rush their logic with patience. The meek are those who have power, but are very reluctant to use it. The very reluctant to believe and believe that Jesus. Jesus had all the power. But when they came to arrest him, they resist. They beat him, they slapped him, they beat him mercilessly. He didn't fight back. That's because of you and I. To be like Jesus. It says, they shall possess the lands and inherit of my holy mountain. You want to be with Jesus when you leave this earth? You make that decision at the late tree. For stealing from lying and those wicked acts. And then it says, shall cast, and I shall say, cast your, cast your, prepare the way, take up the box from the block out of the way of my people. Now, what is saying, he should tell them, Dr. Isaiah should tell them, just like I'm telling you now. Cast your, cast your, prepare the way. That was Remove anything that prevents you from walking with the Lord. What is that evil thing you are doing? Stealing, cheating, fornicating, adultery, blood, money, ritual, idolatry, whatever you are doing now, is just take it away so that you can follow me in holiness and righteousness. What is the stumbling block in your life right now? You say, oh, you are already building a house. And that has been built because of money and fraud and people. Bribery, you're taking bribe. You better stop it because you may not live even in having that house of your own. You see, God is sending a message of money to you today. But God says the Lord Almighty, the lofty one that inhabits eternity. What does that mean? God inhabits eternity. If we have God lives, there is no time there. There's no beginning, there's no end of time. When you count it 10,000 years, it's like a drop in the Pacific Ocean. And that's where you and I will be if we trust Him to follow Him. But the same thing, if you end up in hell, you're going to be there for eternity. So God says, whose name is holy, 
See? That's God's name. Holy, that's why in heaven, the angel says, Holy, holy, holy are thou God. Every time they see a Hebrew wisdom of Jesus, they cry out in awe, Holy, holy, holy. I dwell in a high and holy place. With him that is a contract and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the hand of the contract ones. That's a very powerful word. God says he is holy, one. So he lives in a holy place, heaven. But in that place there are also people. Who are these people? People that have contract and humble spirit. I guess the same thing. In terms of being there, meekness, you can see. A contract and humble spirit, somebody who is humble. Somebody is confident, somebody who is sorry for their sins, who is aware that they are sinners and are ready to repent. These are the ones that live with God. And what happens to them? Because it revives them. In other words, instead of brokenness, it gives them joy. Now they are replaced. Instead of sorrow, there is joy. It turns their money to dancing and sorrow to joy. You see? To revive. The heart of the contract ones and to revive the spirit of the humble ones. See, they are broken because they are going to revive them and going to bring them back up to do my work because they are already qualified to be in a holy place in heaven. Are you ready to glory God? You must have a humble and contract heart. Job 6 verse 10. Job 6 verse 10. Psalm 16, verse 4. said, I dwell in a high and holy place with him or her that is of the contract and humble place. Job 6, 4. Yes. With my strength and the strength of stone. Uh, 6, verse 10, rather. Then I will still have comfort. Mm-hmm. Though in anguish, yes. I will exult. Yes. He will not spare. Yes. So I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. That's it. The words of the Holy One. God is holy. What does holiness mean? Mm. Um, holiness means being God-like. Mm. It's not only failure to sin. It means righteous and loving. If you are holy, you'll be like God. Meaning you forgive your enemies. You won't have a reproach against them. Meaning that you help even your enemies. How many people are like that? So, holiness does not only mean that uh, you are sinless. In any case, don't remember being sinless. But you will be just by the grace of God, Jesus, because of grace. So, God says, He dwells in His holy place with those of the contract and humble spirits, to revive their spirits. Psalm 34, verse 18. Psalm 16, verse 4. Psalm 16, verse 4. Yes. The O. Yes. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him. Mm-hmm. On those who hope in His mercy. Yes. Psalm 16, verse 4 says, The Father that sing unto God, sing praises to His name, extol Him that rise upon the heavens and by His name, Jack, and rejoice before Him. See? God dwells in heaven as holy mountain with those who are the contract and humble spirit. If you are proud, you cannot exist with God. Because the Bible says God hates the proud, but receives the humble. It was pride that made Lucifer to rebel against God because he wanted to be like God. And they cast him out the name of the day. You see, you must have a humble contract heart. Contract means you are aware of your sins, you acknowledge them, and you are sorry for them, you are remorseful, you are repentant, and you are ready and willing to change. Remember the story of the publican and the Pharisee who went to pray? And the, the, the Pharisee, who of course the religious sect, very, very forward, he went to talk God and said, God, I thank you, I'm not like this publican, the Pharisee. You know, the publicans and tax collectors they were very corrupt and sinful. And he said, I come up, I'm not like this publican. I pay my tithes twice a week. I do this, I pray, and all these things he said. 
And the Bible says it's bread and milk the womb. But the publican stood far away from the altar. In fact, he did not even regard himself as clean enough to come here to the Lord. Or even with that Pharisee, he stood far away. And what did he do? He would not even look up to God. He said, he beat his chair and said, Have mercy on me, sinner. The Bible says his prayer went straight to heaven. He was just fine for God. Compared to the so called Pharisee who thought he was better than other people. He said, God wants you and I to be broken before him, to feel sorry for our sins, and to be ready to repent before him. Then and only then can we dwell with him in his holy mountain. When we feel that we're better than others, we are so precious based on what we do, how we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't fornicate, then we are going, not God's going to receive us. And God says, For I will not pretend forever, neither will I be angry, for the speech will tell before me, and the soul to have made. Oh, God says, If He's going to judge you and I for our sinfulness, we will not be able to survive His judgment. In Hebrews 12, verse 9, you know, He will not pretend forever. Psalm 78, 38, and 39. See, God knows we are weak, and we cannot survive His judgment. In fact, the Bible says that God was. How sins who can stand and not die. You see? God says, no. He knows we are weak. He knows our limits. Psalm 78, 38. Huh? Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Yes. Furthermore, yes. we have had human fathers yes. who corrected us, mm-hmm. and we pay them respect. Yes. Shall we not much more ready to be in subjection to the Father of the Spirit and the That's it. And Psalm 78, 38 says, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed their not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. So God knew we are weak. We cannot survive God's judgment. No man can do that. And so for remember that they were for flesh. He knew that passed away and come not again. See? God realizes it. So when he pushes us, he us in measure, not with his full strength, because we no man can survive God's judgment. So for the iniquity of his covetousness, we were rough, angry, and smoking. God is not saying, I was angry with you because of your sin of covetousness. I want to be like this man. I want to have that man's wife. I want my wife to be like that one. I want my car to be like that car. All human beings are covetous. The grass is bitter on the other side. Hmm? Mm-hmm. These are not to be content with what people are giving you. No, you want somebody else's thing. You want that person's wife. You want that person's husband. You want their husband, their car. You want their land. You don't know how they got it all. It's like you want to be like, it's like a show up. That's how it says that when we ask, we ask our niece, you are praying to have a car. Not because you want to serve with that, but because you want to show off to other people that you've arrived. That's why I pray to God for that. God will not give you that time. Hmm. We want this, we want that. Not because you want to pray for God. No, it's because you want people to use that and say, Ah, Kabari Babake, hey, Franka Dede. That's what you want. I pray to God for that. God says he was angry at us because of our covetousness. And God smote us. His anger and judged us. And he hit me. And he went on all the way of the side. Some people, when God is judging them, that's the time they go farther away from God. Instead of coming to God, that's now they come home. Oh, mommy, daddy, please go to uh, that brother, that one for me, that prophet, the village, that shrine. I've lost my job. Did you know that it was because of God's anger that he lost his job? Now, he's going further away from God, seeking a solution. Why? Because he cannot go to God's answer. No, no, no. It was a quick. Return. I want my job back. I want this thing back. Well, you're going to spend a lot of back to back struggling. Because it was angry with them because of covetousness. Ezekiel 33, 31. That's what happened to the people of Israel when they go to the land. They want to be like the people of the land. This is why they asked for God, the king. When they go to the land, they said, Oh, everything has a king. We don't have a king. We like the prophets. No, we don't want to say prophet. We want the king like other people. 
That's covetousness. That's why God gave him Saul. And we know the king of that one. Is it that he can give us one? So they come to you as people do. Yes. They sit before you as my people. Mm-hmm. And they hear your words. Yes. But they do not do them. That is it. So with their mouth, they show much love. Uh-huh. But their hearts pursue their own gain. That is it. They show Indeed, much love. You are to them mm-hmm. as a very lovely son mm-hmm. of one who has a pleasant voice mm-hmm. and can play well on an instrument. So they hear your words, mm-hmm. but they do not do it. This is not a picture of the church. Many of you come to the church day in, day out. But as long as you leave the church, everything you have goes down the tubes. You don't go think about it, you meditate on it, to practice it. You go about living like the devil, and then on Sunday, you come to church wearing a big sutana, a big cross on your neck, and a big Bible. And you say, Praise the Lord. That's what's called Christianity, not Christianity. You don't do what the Bible says, you're only a hearer. That's what it's referring to. You see? And God says, I've seen your ways, but I will heal you. And now, you know, God says, I will heal you. Amen. I will heal you. Even though you've gone against him, God is ready to heal you. I will lead him also and restore comfort unto him and to his mourners. Because you have been mourning because of God's judgment. And God says he's going to heal you and comfort you. How will God heal you? Heal you of the sickness of sin. How? Through the blood of the Lamb Jesus Christ. The only treatment for the sickness of sin is the cross. So the only way you can be healed of this sickness, of this covetousness, of this idolatry, is to come to Jesus and surrender your life to him. And he will heal you of this. And God says, I pray the fruit of the lips. And to him that is peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, say the Lord, and I will heal him. He repeats, God is ready to heal you and I. Once we are ready to surrender to him and to give our life to him, he will heal us. Jesus Christ already did the work on the cross for our healing and restoration. All we have to do is accept it. He says, Come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and get no father, how will I you find rest for the Lord's own souls? From gentle and humble, and my yoke is easy and my body is light. Matthew 11, 25, 30. God says, cry for peace, I will give you peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The only way you have that peace in your life is to come to Jesus. The Acts 2, 39. Acts 2, 39. Says, but the wicked are the troubled sea and cannot rest in what has cast out America and dirt. There is no peace Say my God to the wicked. If you are wicked, this is why you don't have any peace in your life. You struggle today, trouble tomorrow, and you're wondering why you need to change your life. Repent of the wickedness and come to Jesus, and He will grant you His peace. If this requires our understanding, Acts 2 39. One. For the promise is for you. Yes. Then Peter said to them, yes. Repent yes. and let every one of you be baptized uh-huh. in the name of Jesus Christ yes. for the remission of sin. Uh-huh. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. For the promise is for you and your children, yes. and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God has called. That, is it. that peace Jesus Christ gives to you if you come to Him. Maybe your life is like the troubled sea right now. There is no peace in your life. Once you go from one problem to another one starts, and you wonder why, it's very easy. You need to repent of the wickedness. You think God doesn't know what you're doing behind? You can be deceiving the church when actually in behind you are receiving bribes from people, taking money unlawfully, and you wonder why you don't have peace. Of course, that's the reason why. When you repent, turn away from the wickedness and surrender to Jesus. You have supernatural peace. Like even you yourself will not be able to understand. So we say this message, God is saying, I know you've turned from me and 
worship idols. God, I'm ready to heal you. As long as you can come back to me, I will heal you of that sickness of sin. I will bring you back. I will comfort you. I will restore you. Jesus is the healer. He over the earth. He over the world. He is at peace. Only through him can we have the peace of the Lord. The next passage, we go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Are you verse 1? This is a parable that Jesus told to the people to illustrate very important points. So the kingdom of heaven, seven verse one, Matthew twenty verse one. The kingdom of heaven is like a man as a householder who went early in the morning to have the grass of his vineyard. So look at the picture. This man owns a vineyard. He's like owner of a house, but he also owns a vineyard, and he's looking for workers to work in his vineyard. A vineyard is a yard that fruit grows from trees. So you need somebody to maintain the fruit trees, to put out the leaves, to water the plants, to manure it, to maintain it, that, that vineyard. So he goes out in the morning and he sees the grass and he agrees to pay them a penny to work for working throughout the day in his vineyard. So they were sent to the vineyard. And then again he went out to the third hour. The third hour is about nine o'clock. The start comes from six o'clock in the morning. So the third hour is nine o'clock in the morning, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Just like in Nigeria, in many places, workers who are congregated somewhere, knowing that the employers will come to that place to look for workers, and they will be employed to work for the day. So the same thing, he went to this place, the marketplace where the people are congregated, and he found some people there and asked them. He hired them to go and walk in the vineyard. He said, Whatever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. So the second said he didn't give them any promise of any amount. He just said, Whatever is right, I will give you. Well, they were happy. After all, they arrived, they right, they're going to get some money, right? Better than just staying idle in the marketplace. Remember, the devil comes to for that money. Then, what happened again? At the sixth hour, 12 o'clock, at 3 p.m., he went up again. So this man was constantly looking. For workers to walk in his vineyard. And then he did the same thing. He told them, Go well, out in the vineyard, whatever I'm going to give you at the end of the day. And the 11th hour, he went again, found others standing idle. I said, Why do you stand here all the day idle? I mean, those people have been standing there, I don't know how long. But finally, they were hired to go and walk in his vineyard. So, whatever is right, you shall receive that. At the end of the day, he called his uh, uh, agents and said, Look, Go and call them. You can start it from the ones I had last. And I'll give them their pay for the day. So call the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last up to the first. So the people that had hired the eleventh hour, they came and gave them the pen. Then they kept on giving them the pen, everyone was in very much. The people who had lost the money, the money, and give them the pen that price. Now when they received it, they were not happy. He said, How can you have the same pay as those who just work for one hour? We work for 12 hours. He gives us the same pay as those who work for only one hour. You know? So, but he answered them and said, Friend, I did the law wrong. Did you not agree with me for the penny? Take what is yours and me away. I'll give unto the last illness unto you. It's not love for me to do what I will with my own. Is that like I'm evil because I'm good? In other words, you think I'm evil, but I'm giving you what we agreed on from the beginning. We agreed for penny, and you went to work for it. I'm giving it to you. Why are you angry that I'm giving somebody even more than one the same as you? You know? Uh, so the last shall be the first, and the first last. For many shall be called, but few chosen. Let's take it stick by stick. So what these workers were saying in the natural, they could be justified because they felt that they had worked for 12 hours and they had paid the same pay as somebody who had worked for only one hour. So in the natural, it looked like they were justified. But really, this story is supposed to illustrate that this call of God is for your salvation. 
and your salvation cannot be bought by your works. You see, that's what this is illustrating. Some people are called and saved, called to what it was to be here at an early age, and they are rewarded their salvation. Others are called the last minutes, and the same reward is given to them. Remember the case of the robber who was on the right of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he said, What did he tell Jesus? He said, Jesus, remember me in the kingdom. He said, Yeah, yeah. And one of the men was saying, Jesus, are you not the miracle worker? Get out of this mess. I don't disappear. He was not sorry for his sins. He wanted to be let go from what he had done. But the worker of Christ said, No, we, we, we are here because of the evil we did. He's, he's, we are, are rightly being punished, but this man has done anything. He hasn't done anything like that. And he said, Jesus, we can't have anything to go to the kingdom. What did Jesus say? He said, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Can you imagine? That man was condemned to hellfire, had only one hour left. In that one hour, he crossed from hellfire. And is now in heaven with Jesus. Because he was repentant of his sins, he was a contrite man, he was humble, he humbled him before God, and he repented, and he passed from death to life. This is exactly what you're saying here. That man had only one hour, and he received the same gift of salvation as somebody who had known God all his life and worshipped him. Is that there or not? Of course it's there. Because you cannot buy salvation with your works. Some people think that by coming to church, by doing good acts, charitable acts, giving money to the poor, feeding the poor, hungry, housing them, that because of that, they will inherit heaven. No, no, no. You cannot work enough to be worthy to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Salvation is a gift from God. You cannot work to merit it. Nobody can be holy enough or good enough to say that because of these things, I made heaven. That's the fallacy. You made heaven because of God's grace as a gift to you. You cannot work for it. So those people who had worked from the early at the beginning, they felt that their work should earn them something more than the others. So the story is just saying that no. It's not how much you walk, it's my gift to you. That house would give anybody whatever they wanted. It was a gift. You couldn't control them and say, no, why don't you give me this? No. He gave everybody the same, which is the gift of salvation. That's what this parable is illustrating. You know? He said, it's like, I am evil because I'm good. So you are accusing me of being unfair, but I can do whatever I want with my money. Saying that salvation is a gift is not something you work for. Ephesians 2 8 and 9. Ephesians 2 8 and 9. Romans 9 21. And Proverbs 23 verse 6. Ephesians 2 8 and 9. We need to realize this because many people are deceived in many religions that, oh, if they do good acts, they will make heaven. So by grace are you saved through faith. You are saved by grace. In other words, you do not merit it, you do not work for it. It's purely by the grace of God. Through faith, that was believing in what Jesus did for you on the cross, taking the penalty for your sins and redeeming you by paying his life blood. That's how they're saved. If you believe that, you'll be saved because of God's grace. And it says, and that not of yourselves, meaning that not because of the good works or charity good works. Some people at this time they get crucified in the Philippines. They beat themselves until they're bleeding, thinking that by doing this flagellation, they would get inherited heaven. No, no, you can beat yourself to you are blinded. You will not get to heaven. Please do not. Say not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See? It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. You cannot earn it. 
Those people who are kind of trying to say that they are earning, that they deserve it. And the last one said, no, no, no. I give everyone as I wish. It's not because of the works, it's a gift. It's a lot of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 3 20. Romans 3 20. See, so begin to realign your heart and your thinking. You cannot get saved by how good you are. No, you have to come to Jesus and give you his gifts, which he already did the work. You don't have to do any work. Just obey him, surrender to him, and you give him that gifts. Romans 3 20 says that the structure of the foolish is a teacher of babes. Oh, sorry. Romans 3 20. Therefore, uh-huh. by the deeds of the law, by the deeds of the law, or your works, no flesh uh-huh. will be justified. That is it. In Christ. That's it. For by the law, mm-hmm. is the knowledge of sin. One. But now, yes. the righteousness of God, yes. apart from the law, yes. is revealed, uh-huh. being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's it. Even uh-huh. the righteousness of God, yes. through faith in Christ Jesus, that is it. to all who believe. That's it. Through faith in Christ Jesus. That means his faith the belief in what he did for you on the cross that will save you. You cannot earn it, you cannot be holy enough, you cannot be charitable enough. Without Jesus, you can never get help. So if you say that, oh, I don't need Jesus, all I have to do is do good works, feed the poor and hungry, house them, give them money, give scholarship, all these things, I'm going to get help. You are deceiving yourself. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one, repeat, no one comes to the Father except through me. And the only way through Jesus is by accepting him as your Lord and Savior. And accept the sacrifice of pain for you on the cross. So that is what that, illu- that illustration, that story, the parable, that's what illustrated. That's what Jesus was trying to say. As I said, so the last shall be first and the first last. What did he mean by that? That the last shall be first and the first last. The first, the last, those are the ones who are based their salvation on their works, the religious sects. The people who think they are holy, the Pharisees, they are going to come last in the line of just entering heaven. Because they are the ones that would be saved last. But the last people are the fornicators, the prostitutes, the adulterers. Because they received Christ last. But they believed and accepted it. They accepted him. You know, Jesus ate with the prostitutes, ate with the publicans, and the Pharisees were upset with him. But well, they received him, whereas the Pharisees did not receive him. That's what he meant by that the last, those who are saved, that like that robber who died on the cross of Jesus, he was saved last. He was a robber, he was a murderer. Mm-hmm. But he received Jesus, and boy, was with Jesus the same day in heaven. Mm-hmm. Whereas all the Pharisees were not believing in Jesus, and they were supposed to be the religious people. That's exactly what Jesus means. So which position are you today? Are you among the first who believe that your righteousness will give you to heaven? Or among the last who have only received Jesus wholeheartedly? Which group do you belong to today? Mark 10, that's one. Mark 10, that's one. And Luke 14, 20. For many be called, but few are chosen. When it says many be called, means many in his church are called. People who know Jesus Christ in the church. But many of them are not chosen because they didn't believe. They are not surrounded in the life of Christ. They are still going on their works, works of candles, works of eggs, all these works. They think some people think that because we are celestial, we go to heaven. <laughs> the greatest lie in this time. The question is, is your name in the book of life? One, ready? So, but many who are first. Yes. Yes. And the last person. You see? Because those first people are the religious people. Who think they know Christ, but they have never been saved. They are just going by their good works. You know, Jesus Christ said, Your your religion will be more than that of the Pharisees. And that is humanly impossible because the Pharisees obey the law perfectly. So how can you beat them? You can't beat them except through Jesus Christ and to accept and surrender Jesus Christ because even though we are observers of the law, they still have many sins. Now, you no matter how much you try, you cannot be perfect. 
perfect. No man is perfect. But when it comes to Jesus, He will give you His perfection. And God will look at you through Jesus' perfection and cancel all your sins. Many of you are walking around with a heavy sack of sins and believing that you are going to heaven. You are not. You need to come to Jesus to surrender to Him and your weight of sins will be cancelled. I know what I'm talking about because I experienced it myself. The day you are born again, that huge weight of sin which you are carrying, which you don't know, and is leading you to hell, that weight will be cut away and you feel very light. It's like a little fly. I know, I experienced it. You need to do that today. You are listening to me, and maybe you are among the first. You are a religious person, you go to church, you attend church regularly. Maybe you are in the choir, maybe you are a prophet, maybe you are a shepherd, maybe you are an evangelist. Maybe you're a spirit evangelist. But all your life, you've been just for 35 years, you've never really been born again. Let that end today. Let today be the end of your religiosity and self righteousness. Commit to surrender your life to Jesus today, and you will save your soul. Because he said, We are not justified by the works of the law. Are you observing all the rules of the church? Oh, I don't know this. Oh, I, have, I don't have to wait. Oh, I don't smoke. I don't drink. <laughs> is nowhere that was perfection. That can never be to heaven. It's only through Jesus. Because Jesus will be the Lord perfectly. And when you come to him, he will give you. It's called the imparted righteousness. You'll be given that gift of salvation. His righteousness, his cloth of will be given to you. And then God will see you as perfect. Not in your own works, but the works of Jesus Christ. So if you are ready and willing today, just say this simple prayer to me. Lord Jesus, I have sinned against God and man. I'm sorry for my sins. Have mercy and forgive me of my sins today. Wash my sins away with the precious blood of man. Then come inside my heart, begin to rule and reign over my life. Take my name from the book of the dead, for those going to hell, and put my name in your book of life and death. And I promise to serve you and follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 That's it. You said that prayer and meant it. But what of your heart? You will see a drastic change in your life. Why? Because just from the cup inside your heart, your weight of sins will be removed. Even though you are the same person, is a new spirit inside you. Just imagine you have a car. That car is maybe that maybe five years old. Yeah. And then you go and change the battery of that car. So the car now has a new power inside it. And even though the body is the same, that car will function. 10 times better with the new battery or the new engine. That's exactly what will happen today, today, if you surrender to Jesus. That heavy weight of sin you've been dragging on your life will be cut away because Jesus already paid for that sin on the cross. Then he will enter your heart with the Holy Spirit and change you. How? You find that you taste and become different. No longer you will really feel the need to be doing all these bad, bad things, smoking, drinking, humanizing, whatever you've been doing. Now, all you want to do is read your Bible, be in church, associate with other Christians, speak to people about Jesus, tell them to get them saved. That's all you're thinking about. That is convincing evidence that you're truly born again. Even when you're the same body, there's a new spirit, a new human being inside you. So the old has gone, the new has come. That is what will happen to you. Let us pray. For what Jesus Christ in the night of God, Lord, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful words of Christ to us today. Uh, let this words bring forth a hundredfold harvest in our lives. Heal us of the sickness of sin through the shed blood of the Lamb. Let us know that salvation is a gift and we cannot walk for it. 
They live out the spirit of religiosity and self righteousness. Let your truth set us free. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. And that's it for today. Please revise these passages. Meditate on them. Eat them like food. Let God mix that to you with them. Uh, God will change your life forever. Take care of this. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. He's a miracle walking God. He's a miracle walking God.